thank you very much for, for coming. I, I just want to start off with an announcement that um, I know many people who come to the seminars regularly are concerned with issues of anti-Semitism and contemporary aspects of it politically and intellectually. And I just wanted to say, I, I don't want to be melodramatic and be political at an academic event, but I think the events of uh, yesterday in the United Kingdom are very important. And uh, people should, I think, follow what's going to happen with the academic union in the, in the United Kingdom and their boycott of Israeli universities and Israeli academics. And I'm afraid that other unions are going to start joining the bandwagon and it's going to be a bit of an opening of the floodgates. And I think as scholars and as intellectuals and people dealing with these issues that we really should keep abreast and hopefully um, perhaps collectively try to understand and deal with these issues. So, so please keep your eyes open for that. Um, so it's really it's an honor to, to have distinguished guests here with us. I would like to say that the lunch is being sponsored by Yale University Press who published uh, the book that we're going to hear about. And I'd like to thank uh, Jonathan and, and, and his associates for, for helping set up the event for the day. Um, so we're very uh, privileged to have Isabel Ganor and Gideon Ramez to speak today about their book, uh, Fox Bats over, the, over the Mona, The Soviet's Nuclear Gamble in the Six-Day War. It's doing very well internationally. It's actually number one on Amazon.com uh, for Russian history. And it's creating waves, I think, uh, um, among scholars and historians of how the 67 war is perceived and understood. Isabel Minor is a research fellow at the Harry Truman Institute uh, for the Advancement of Peace at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. She was born originally in Ukraine and since 1967 has lived in Israel, where she's a commentator in the Israeli and foreign media. Gideon Ramez is a well-known radio and print journalist uh, in Israel. What? Okay. <laughs> and now well-known author. Uh, he, fought a, he fought in the Six-Day War and was a frontline correspondent during the Suez Canal Theater and the Yom Kippur War in 1973. And both authors uh, already lived in Jerusalem. So it's really an honor to have you here with us today. Thank you. Well, first of all, let us uh, say that we are very flattered to see such a big audience here. We never expected such a, a public event of our uh, seminar, and uh, really it's a great honor to us to uh, see so many people who take interest in the subject. And it's also a great honor today for us that until less uh, than a year ago, it was a totally unexpected honor for us to address you here at one of America's most distinguished universities while holding up a book bearing the imprimatur of this institution. And for making this dream of any scholar come true, we all thanks first and foremost to Jonathan Brandt, who uh, the editorial director of the University Press, who unfortunately and to leave today for another trip to Moscow and uh, he's there to pursue the project of which his leadership made his recognition of our work such a distinction. The monumental series of uh, Annals of Communism which has established his leading authority in the field. And uh, after offering us to expand our series of research papers into a book, it was Jonathan who steered it uh, at record speed for the odyssey that every manuscript must endure, in time to bring it out at the most appropriate moment, without compromising its academic rigor. And so its release marks the 40th anniversary of the Six Day War, the epochal event in the Middle Eastern, a global history that our inquiry has cast in a new light. Jonathan and everyone else at Yale University Press who were saddled with the frequently onerous task of handling us, have earned our unbounded gratitude. And we are equally indebted to Professor Small for discerning our book's relevance to the Yale Initiative for the inter Interdisciplinary Study of Antisemitism, which he founded at least for, for inviting us to speak from this platform. And in this presentation, we will therefore attempt to demonstrate both the very substantial aspects of this relevance 
and to be honest, its limits. To do so, we must first outline our overall thesis and point out where it differs from nearly all previous scholarship on the 67 war in general and on the Soviet role in its genesis and conduct in particular. We embarked on this project some seven years ago, embarked literally as the initial clue was Mabel. At the time and to this day, the prevalent, indeed virtually unchallenged concept was that the causes for the war were primarily regional and had been building up for years before the USSR ignited the finger pole with a false warning to Egypt that Israel was massing troops on the Syrian border in numbers that Israel's army couldn't possibly muster. But this Soviet disinformation of May 13, 1967 was held to be a routine exercise that got out of hand some sort of individual error or low-level low miscalculation, and Moscow was considered to have blundered into a conflict that it never desired. And once escalation began toward all-out war, the Soviet Union did all it could in order to contain the crisis. It was long since known that after debating the hotline to the White House on 5 June, for the first time since its inception following the Cuban Missile Crisis, Soviet Premier Alexei Kosygin did use it on 10 June to threaten measures, including military. But this was conventionally dismissed as either mere bluster or as an empty gesture of deterrence. We, therefore, reacted with disbelief when seven years ago we came across the first piece of new evidence to the contrary. This was a story published in the Ukrainian newspaper by a retired Navy captain, Yuri Nikolaevich Kripulkov, now a respected educator and public figure in Donetsk. He related that in 1967, he was a young gunner lieutenant on a brand new frigate, which has been dispatched to, uh, directly from a Baltic shipyard to the Eastern Mediterranean in early May, that is, well before the overt outbreak of the crisis. On June 5th, his captain ordered him to assemble a platoon of 30 so-called volunteers over a quarter of the ship's company and to lead them in the raid on the Israeli shore. The operation was held up repeatedly until on June 10th, the ship was ordered to begin the operation. But when it came within 20 miles of its objective, the landing was aborted. Impossible, we saw, but here is where our journalistic training intervened. Instead of dismissing a factual claim a priori because it conflicted with the theoretical concept, our instinct declared a thorough check of even an ostensibly preposterous claim, and if it turned out to be valid, to contemplate a posteriori reappraisal of the concept. What then have we concluded about the Soviet role in the crisis and war? As you now can read the book, let me just state our main fighting uh, in brief. We believe we have demonstrated convincingly that the Soviet Union, starting at the latest in mid-1966, elaborated with Egypt and Syria a detailed plan for precipitating the crisis. It was aimed at provoking Israel into a preemptive strike, which would then justify a direct military intervention by the USSR in favor of its clients and against the so-called aggressor. In the Soviet estimate, if Israel and its Arab neighbors were allowed to fight it out on their own, they would reach a stalemate. Even a limited Soviet intervention might thus keep the balance against Israel. And while the USSR did not actively seek a superpower clash, it was prepared to assume some risk by probing the envelope. It assumed that the United States would be less likely to respond in kind if the Israelis struck first. And certainly, if the Soviet's prime motive and target was Israel's nuclear problem, program, which was our latest and most dramatic discovery. Before Gideon goes on to introduce some new evidence confirming this thesis, let me address the aforementioned question of motivation. You have not heard me claim that Moscow instigated the 67 crisis out of uniquely anti Semitic motives even under the guise of anti-Zionism, anti-imperialism, or the like. Overall, our book is not an anti-communist uh, diatribe, not a value judgment of the Soviet Union's conduct. 
As Gideon cited to me the maxim he was told 30 years ago in International Relations 101, the Soviets were in main, merely following the rules that the strong do what they can, and the weak must suffer what they must. Their American rivals did pretty much the same. And yet we could hardly overlook the special baggage the Soviet Russia brought along to its dealing with the Jewish state, dating with sometimes, sometimes astonishing similarity back to the time, to Tsar's times. The imperial regime's long record of anti-Semitic uh, repression and incitement, often, desi often designed as an outlet for popular resentment, was of course one of the prime causes for the rise of Zionism among the Jews of Russia in the 1880s, and hence ultimately for the establishment of Israel. This was not unrelated to the Tsar's centuries of aspiration both to warm water access to the Mediterranean and to the status of Orthodox Christianity's protector in the Holy Land. There were even calls to make Palestine a Russian possession, among other purposes, in order to get Russia with its Jews. In 1903, another spate of Tsarist inspired massacres are kind of the Jewish movement for settlement in Palestine, now with a distinctly soci socialist character. Russian born labor Zionists became the leading force in the fast developing Jewish community of Palestine. The first international confirmation of Jewish entitlement to the country, Britain's Balfour Declaration, was issued coincidentally but symbolically within a week of Bolshevik Revolution in November 1970. But this also cost the Nazi Jewish national home in Palestine, now under a British mandate, in the view of newly formed USSR as an agent of British imperialism. Religious persecution was officially barred, but since, since the Zionist activity ran counter to Stalin's minority policy, it was combated both with antidotes, such as a Jewish autonomous region in the Far East, a strictly confined Yiddish cultural activity, as well as <coughs> direct repression. In Palestine, some of the social Zionist groups maintained their principal support of the USSR, while trying to explain Stalin's quote, misunderstanding, unquote, of their case. Russian revolutionary songs, slogans, and literature remain staples of labor Zionist youth movements and paramilitary organizations. When an opportunity to hasten the British retreat from Palestine appeared in 1947, the Soviet switch from anti-Zionist repression at home to support for Jewish statehood was so sweet as to surprise even a pre-state Israeli leadership. A recent Russian history of Israel describes this as a tactical move only, which was made because Zionists, unlike Arab regimes leaning on England, would be used to strengthen the USSR's post for international relations. At the United Nations, then Soviet Ambassador Andrei Gromyko, acting on Stalin's orders, embraced the partition plan for Palestine far more decidedly than the United States. Stalin evidently believed that Israel would be a natural candidate for satellite status and would offer the USSR such Cold War benefits as its long coveted Mediterranean naval base. It may have been confirmed in this illusion by the fact that much of the US official though openly feared the same. When Israel declared independence on 14 May 1948, Moscow was the second government to recognize it after the United States. But whereas Washington's recognition was de facto, the USSR's was the UN. Soviet armed supplies via Czechoslovakia were instrumental in ensuring Israel's survival. A proposal even circulated in Moscow to absorb half a million refugees from <coughs> Palestine in an Arab Soviet Republic, which might have reduced the perennial problem that has haunted Israel ever since. But the Israeli uh, leadership's unwillingness to build socialism on the Soviet model soon led to radical correction of this operation in Soviet Middle Eastern policy, especially after Israel's immigration of Jewish and Zionist identity was demonstrated by enthusiastic Jews who mocked the inaugural appearance of Israel's first envoy. Stalin's psychotically anti-Semitic fit in his final years, which Jonathan has documented in his book on the doctor's plot, was prevented from reaching catastrophic proportions only by Stalin's death. And I will just say that one of my earliest childhood memories 
is the exact location of a suitcase with my mother's essentials and my own, which was prepared in our vestibule in anticipation that all Jews would be rounded up. And my father had another suitcase as women and men would go to a separate cave. Our deliverance from this fate by Stalin's death was conventionally and silently celebrated as a poor miracle. Nonetheless, his successors cemented most alignment with the progressive and quote, out of regimes, <coughs> beginning ironically in 1955 with another Czech arm bill, this time for Egypt. Also, the United States was at least as responsible as uh, the Soviet Union took credit for beating all British, French, and Israeli sign and so its campaign with no less threats. And as we have discovered, there's a direct, uh, so limited combat involvement of fighter pilots. This created both the precedent and the infrastructure for the joint Soviet-Egyptian plan that, as we assert, deliberately precipitated the 1967 crisis. The motives were in the main strategic in the Cold War context. Assisted in the field of future by the USSR's Arab clients who strengthened both their own original standing and their dependence on Moscow while undermining the regimes allied with Israel's supposed supporter the United States. Control could be established over Middle Eastern oil outlets, those increasing Soviet leverage on Western Europe. And as Gideon will soon point out, a perceived nuclear threat to the Soviet Union itself, as well as its regional power projection, could thus be removed. However, the USSR was formally committed to, the, uh, to its recognition of Israel, and at Moscow State as an official policy goal, the reduction of the Jewish state to the borders, it was assigned by the partition plan of 47, which Moscow had endorsed. Along with the return of the Arab refugees to its territory, this might well doom the state's long-term viability. But, but Soviet statesmen from Stalin to Gromyko are recorded as recognizing that Israel's continued existence was, for the time being, beneficial to Soviet interests as the Arabs would have to rely on Moscow's support against it. It is therefore interesting to note the recurrence of the Soviet, in the Soviet parlance of the time of a subtext calling for Israel's total elimination as a war goal of projected war results in 1967. Soviet diplomats in various capitals predicted or threatened that the impending war would leave no remnant of Israel. In two testimonies were received after completing the book, Israeli communist leaders were reassured that Soviet forces would be there to protect them by application to rescue them from the fate that was about to befall other Israelis. Here too, I can add my own personal recollection. When I had to turn in my consumer card ahead of departure for Israel in late uh, 1966, I was told by the organization chiefs in my hometown, Chernobyl, that I am a tracker, and there's going to be a war, and uh, I will volunteer to fight for Egypt, and I will kill you. Such sentiment at the local level adopted the signals from at least part of the leadership. Defense Minister Andrei Grechko, for instance, is reported to have issued an order of the day to the Soviet officer's course, promising that the jubilee year of the Bolshevik Revolution would be the last year of the Zionist state. The physically imposing Grechko is described as prone to violent gesticulation as he declared his determination to wipe out imperialism and Zionism, which is hardly surprising given his useful service in the civil wars Red Cavalry led by the murderous pogromshik Semyon Budyonik. And the Soviet Union's dispassion and strategic <coughs> population were thus also tinged with old-fashioned Russian anti-Semitism. Happily, it is now anyone's guess whether had the Soviet air plan been played out in 1967, the USSR, the USSR against its own, own interests and declared policy, would have cooperated or acquiesced with its air class declared aim of eradicating Israel. What can be stated with certainty is that the plan's fiasco ushered in a resurgence of official anti-Semitic venom to a level that had not been registered since Stalin's death. 
The interplay of these two cards, geopolitical strategy and anti-Semitic animals, continued in the USSR until its downfall, and in our opinion is little change in Russia today. But our book is limited to the 1967 war. After initial novel clue led us to assemble a mass of evidence for the Soviet air plan and its actual activation, the directors of our thesis had uh, cogent obje objection. They pointed at a disproportion between any of or all of the Soviet regional war aims that I just listed and the enormous global risks up to a nuclear <coughs> clash that would be run by instigating a conflict and intervening in it uh, directly, the gamble referred to in our book's subtitle. We do not have any basis to claim that the added factor was anti-Semitic fervor, so as I have shown, it definitely was present and helped in recruiting popular support <coughs> for the enterprise, as well as intensifying morale. We do believe that the, uh, that the dispro disproportionality objection has been answered by identifying one of the Soviet's main motives, if not their main motive, and certainly the fact that they determined the timing, preventing Israel's attainment of nuclear weapons. It is no coincidence that uh, the one keyword of our title is Dimona, the location of Israel's main nuclear facility. I will now give the uh, floor to Gideon to account for the other keyword, false bias. Thank you. <coughs> and the, the fact that I am skipping all the thanks and uh, acknowledgments that Isabella listed doesn't mean I don't endorse them. I wholeheartedly do. <laughs> I just would not, would not like to repeat everything. Uh, since I am now venturing into highly sensitive territory, let me stress that our analysis of the nuclear issue pertains to the Soviet interest in perception of and response to Israel's nuclear program and not to the latter's actual history, of which we have no independent information. However, we believe that omitting the entire nuclear element from most discussions of the Six-Day War has meant the disregard of a factor which in the Cold War logic of the 1960s could not but have figured centrally in all the parties' considerations. Indeed, Egyptian documents captured in Sinai and published very shortly after the war identified Dimona as a major target for aerial bombardment. Still, most histories have either ignored or downplayed the nuclear <coughs> issue as a cause of the crisis, even for Egypt, and the USSR is hardly mentioned at all in this context. We now know that an Egyptian airstrike at Dimona was one of the two perceived threats that the Israeli leadership consistently feared the worst. The other threat was direct Soviet military involvement. But both these factors rarely, if ever, figured in post-war public or academic discourse. We attribute this largely to the reticence of Israeli scholars on the nuclear issue and to the successful Soviet cover-up of Moscow's failed initiative, a cover-up that continues in post-Soviet Russia and other uh, post-Soviet republics. We have quite easily detected crude attempts to cast the USSR's moves as responsive rather than aggressive, <coughs> dating them after rather than before the Israeli opening strike on June the 5th. For example, the general in command of the strategic bombers that were to strike Israeli targets has stated that after the war's outbreak, he received oral orders to issue the target maps to the pilots, strip the crews of identified documents, and paint the planes in Egyptian markings. But, he added, he had a logistical problem. It was a Sunday, and the paint factories were closed. A uh, story that for anyone with military or bureaucratic experience has the ring of truth. Uh, now, the war began on Monday, and famously went on for six days, so there was no Sunday in the course of the war. Uh, the paint incident, and therefore the order to prepare an airstrike on Israel, was therefore issued on June the 4th. And in fact, he relates that some parts of it were actually carried out one day earlier. That is, before the Israeli first shot was fired, but this fact is still rather clumsily being concealed in Russia. In fairness, we must point out that similar cover-ups are still in effect in the United States and Israel too. We have established, for example, that Israel did take Soviet prisoners of war on the Golan Heights, which Israel officially denies to this day, although the rumors have been rampant for 40 years. We can also state with certainty that the mission of the ill-fated USS Liberty was primarily to monitor Soviet communications. 
But the thick pack of documents on this aspect that the NSA provided in response to my Freedom of Information Act request was so heavily sanitized, including every mention of a Russian element, that I was even exempted for payment for the photocopying and posting. <laughs> uh, getting back to the Soviet strategic bombers that I mentioned before, their commander stated that their main targets were objectives protected by Israel's US-made Hawk missiles. Now, the only installation that was so defended in 1967 was the Dimona complex. This was one of many thinly disguised references that we found after our interest was ignited by the almost certainly inadvertent inclusion in a recently published collection of Soviet foreign ministry documents of a very <coughs> remarkable memorandum. It is dated February 1966 and relates how several weeks earlier, Isser Harel, the former Mossad chief, who was then an advisor to Prime Minister Levi Eshkol, relayed a message via the leader of Israel's Communist Party, Moshe Sne, to the Soviet embassy in Tel Aviv. The message was that despite its official ambiguity, Israel was bent on developing and procuring nuclear weapons. Our book discusses a wide variety of possible motives for Harel's extraordinary move. But what matters is that the Soviets took his message to be official and acted upon it as a grave threat both to Soviet interests and even to the USSR's own security. During the 1956 sinai suez crisis, as Isabella mentioned before, a Soviet nuclear threat directed at Israel, Britain, and France sufficed to hold their offensive against Egypt. 1956 remained for the Soviets a successful example of how they could employ their nuclear power to limit Israeli action against their Arab clients, but only so long as Israel itself had no counter deterrent. Besides, in Moscow, there was evidently real as well as feigned anxiety over a direct nuclear threat to its own southern regions, especially since <coughs> Moscow also connected Israel's perceived nuclear aspirations with the Soviets' much greater phobia of West German nuclear armament. By 1965, when the message was transmitted, the Soviets were certainly aware of Israel's nuclear project itself, which had been a top priority for its spies in Israel, some of whom Harel himself exposed. It is far less certain whether they had precise information as to the stage that Israel's development had reached. Therefore, when the Soviets received an unambiguous message from an authoritative Israeli source that Israel had decided, after much hesitation following uh, the resignation of Ben-Gurion, the originator of the project, had decided to go ahead with developing an atomic bomb and still intended to arm itself with such a weapon, the main news for Moscow must have been the fact that this goal had not yet been consummated and that a window of opportunity therefore still existed to prevent its fruition. It thus confronted the USSR with a dilemma not unlike the one that Washington is now facing vis-a-vis -vis Iran. For lack of time, I can only refer you to the book itself for the spurt of Soviet counteraction that immediately followed Harel's disclosure. It began with diplomatic efforts to dissuade Israel, but within a few months it shifted to military preparations. Besides the joint war plan that was elaborated by the two defense chiefs, that is, Gretschko on the Soviet side and Amr, Abdel Hakim Amr on the Egyptian side, these included a nuclear guarantee for Egypt instead of supplying it with countervailing nuclear weapons. One of the first elements of the Soviet intervention to be implemented early in 1967, as Isabella mentioned, was the insertion of nuclear missile submarines into the Mediterranean and later into the Red Sea with orders to fire them on a prearranged code signal if Israel did explode any nuclear device, which there was increasing evidence that by this point it was on the very verge of assembly. But as I have already mentioned, the Soviets also prepared to assist in a conventional strike on the Israeli nuclear project. I'll skip any more details of these Soviet actions in order to focus on the single case that both exemplifies our research, our research methodology and also ties together all the strands of this thesis, in addition to explaining how the title Fox Bats got there in the first place. It has also provided us with the most gratifying instance of conclusive official corroboration after the manuscript was completed, so that here I am telling you something you will not be able to read in the book. I refer to the two reconnaissance flights that passed over Dimona on the 17th and the 26th of May 1967. As we know today from both Israeli and U.S. documents, these flights caused such consternation in the Israeli leadership that they were a major catalyst for its decision to go to war, 
since neither either Israel's warplanes nor those Hawk missiles managed to intercept the intruders. No official version was ever published about these overflights. The details emerged over the years in a bewildering variety of versions as to the number, the path, and the behavior of the hostile aircraft, which, while described as mysterious, are also identified universally as, quote, apparently, unquote, Egyptian MiG-21s. We've often compared our entire research to a 10,000-piece puzzle of which five random pieces arrive in the mail every week. In the case of the Dimona overflights, however, our progress was more like a detective novel, since we were lucky enough for the evidence to present itself in a sequence that permitted some linear deduction. This began from the equivalent of a suspicious alibi. The performance of the MiG-21 was so similar to that of Israel's top fighter, the Mirage 3C, that the latter's failure even to engage the intruders seemed highly unlikely. That in itself, of course, is no proof to the contrary, but it led to the question, if not MiG-21s, what were those planes? Here we could extrapolate from other cases. In 1971-72, Soviet pilots carried out all of the reconnaissance sorties over Sinai and Israel proper that were needed in order to prepare Israel's cross-canal offensive in 1973. Egypt, sorry. Cross-canal offensive in 1973. The Soviets flew the still experimental <coughs> MiG-25, which was dubbed by NATO the Foxback, which even then far outdid any Western fighter in speed and altitude and then, too, Israel could do nothing about it. Could the Soviets have done the same as early as 1967, before the West even knew that this model existed? Western observers were first given a glimpse of the MiG-25 on July the 9th, July 67, at an air show near Moscow, a date which now seems to us less than coincidental. We soon discovered circumstantial evidence, statements in the Russian aviation literature, that the plane's prototypes, which had been setting records since 1964, were tested operationally in the Arab-Israeli arena in the late 1960s. Indeed, one reconnaissance variant of the model was developed specifically for the purpose. Once we knew what to look for, we quite easily found several testimonies that were given from 1993 on by General Alexander Vigornov, a hero of the Soviet Union from World War II, who shot down 28 German planes, who had little reason to fabricate this detail for his own glorification. He reiterated on a number of occasions, and recently insisted on this version, that in 1967 he flew a dozen operational sorties out of Egypt. <coughs> Two of these flights were the MiG-25 over Israel, and they were so sensitive that the defense minister in Moscow himself had to approve every one. In fact, the Bonner repeated the story in the United States when he was invited to attend the annual gathering of eagles at Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama. This prime piece of evidence in English has waited unnoticed on an official U.S. Air Force website since 1999. He even added the equally sensational statement that he was sent to Egypt to command a putative air intervention in favor of the Arabs against Israel, and that he witnessed the Israeli bombing of an Egyptian base. That is, the Bornov mission preceded the war. He was there when it started. And its post-dating, in a Russian magazine article from 1993, is again a ham-handed attempt at a cover-up at positing the Soviet intervention as reactive rather than um, aggressive. Checking back against even the most detailed Israeli versions to date, we found that there was nothing to refute the participation of at least one MiG-25 in each of the incidents. In each case, at least one intruder had outrun the interceptors unseen and unidentified. Even had visual contact been made, no Israeli pilot yet had any idea that the model existed, let alone what it looked like. So misidentification would have been natural. Now that we had a material witness, we felt we could issue an indictment. That is, the paper that we published and that led Yale's Jonathan Brent to envisage this book in the first place. He and other Cold War specialists understood that even without the other evidence we had assembled, and we had quite a good deal of it, the fact that the USSR committed its own top pilots and aircraft at the height of the 1967 crisis, when war would break out at any provocation, for the most provocative gesture conceivable over Israel's most guarded target, all this was enough to dispose of the orthodoxy about Moscow's inadvertent blunder into the war and its supposed attempts to defuse the crisis. This is especially true of the second flight, which took place while the Egyptian minister of war, Shams Panvan, 
was in Moscow, poring with a Soviet counterpart over the maps that I mentioned before, and begging for clearance to strike first. Of course, he was absolutely right. If the Egyptians had struck first, history would have been very different. But the Soviets prevailed on him and on Nasser to hold back until Israel struck, lest they be branded the aggressors, which would bar the Soviets from aiding them. At this juncture, the second Fox Bat flight was clearly meant to show that the Soviets were in earnest and to ensure, successfully enough, that Israel was scared into action. The Fox Bat case thus united all the components, intentional Soviet precipitation of the war, direct military intervention, the centrality of the nuclear issue, and the targeting of Israel's nuclear program. Although Vibornov's testimony had never been officially confirmed, we rested our case in the form of this book, quite confident that we had secured a conviction. But while the jury was still out, we were handed the stunning bonus of a signed confession. As so often occurred in our research, the most telling details emerged parenthetically in a document that was composed for an entirely different purpose. This was an article signed by the chief spokesman of the Russian Air Force and posted on the Defense Ministry's official website. That's about as official as you can get. It was written, of all things, to mark the anniversary of the Russian Air Force's pilot, test pilot training school. But it just happened to list among the graduates' achievements one Alexander Bezhevets, then a colonel and now a general, who before the Sixth Day War in 1967 carried out two, quote, unique, unquote, flights over Israel in the big 25. Yes. So we believe, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that your only verdict now can be guilty as charged. Uh, even if all the rest of our evidence is added to the dossier, the reappraisal of Cold War history, not to mention Middle Eastern annals, uh, must now be given. But you must be asking, why did most of the Soviet intervention never take place? One hardly needs to tell an American audience, four years into the Iraqi war, how even the best laid plans of a superpower can go terribly wrong, and for what perennially recurring reasons. The Soviets correctly predicted not only that the Israelis would be drawn to striking first, and that the U.S. would consequently, as it had warned, declare neutrality, and withdraw its fleet from the Eastern Med. They even knew or figured out the date of the Israeli strike, and we have quite clear evidence of this. But as in many other points in this narrative, their Russian-scale concepts were completely out of line with Middle Eastern reality, and as we have seen, the Egyptians understood the situation much better. One hilarious example was given by the last surviving member of the Soviet leadership in 1967, Egolchev. Still trying to excuse the mid-May disinformation, he asked recently, why did you Israelis have to be so brazen? Couldn't you have hidden your troop concentrations in the forest, say, 70 kilometers from the Syrian border, he asked, oblivious of the fact that 70 kilometers from the Syrian border is deep in the Mediterranean. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise, when the Soviet, uh, Soviets contemplated an Israeli offensive, what they evidently had in mind was a World War II-style land offensive across a broad front. They did not foresee the character of the devastating effect of Israel's strike at Arab air bases, which made their use by Soviet planes impossible. And without air superiority, the calculated risk of the original plan, as Isabella described before, became intolerable. Egypt's belated acknowledgment that its plight was desperate also contributed to the Politburo's five days of dithering, whether to act as planned at any price or not. <coughs> On the sixth day, what was planned as a surprise operation was activated openly, this time as the deterrent threat over the hot line, and with some success. The Soviet landing force was sent in toward its planned bridgeheads, but within two hours, Israel did stop dragging its feet on a ceasefire in the Golan Heights. We have been able here to present in a very abridged form only a handful out of the numerous exhibits that make up our case. We will gladly respond to any questions now, but even that can hardly to do justice to 304 pages, which, if we do say so ourselves, are short on theory and long on factual detail. If this 40-year-old but still enigmatic issue intrigues you as irresistibly as it did us, we beg you to take the trouble and wade through it all before you accept or reject it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a fascinating uh, paper talk, and now we can open it up for uh, questions. We have about 35 minutes to the one thing. Hi, it's fascinating, fascinating. Uh, looking back is wonderful, and I'm, 
I, I, I can't help but try to look forward and see if there are any lessons we can learn from this and how to deal with the nuclear threat from the bond today. <laughs> well, first of all, we are going to have a nuclear on the military strategy. But we did make the analogy, so it's a legitimate question. Oh, but uh, I think that, uh, in my personal opinion, whoever thinks about dealing with somebody else's nuclear uh, program has to uh, think not once, not twice, but for seven times. Uh, and then uh, uh, to take one step back before taking any action, because as Gino said, any best made plans are um, uh, prone to backfire. In, in this particular case, if we look also at what, what made the Soviet plan go wrong, it was a beautiful plan. It was too beautiful. Depended on too many things going to spread, but mainly, and this is a problem I think that the U.S. faces today in the Arab world. I think the Soviets, unlike their partners in the arena, first of all, they thought they knew better than the Arabs. They did. Uh, second, um, they applied Soviet Soviet way of thinking and uh, Soviet ideas of scale and of distance and so on to the Middle Eastern area. None of it worked. I mean, the very, the very fact that they accused Israel, even for propaganda purposes, of the obviously false concentration of 10, 13, 18, 20 brigades of the Golan Heights, Israel didn't have that many brigades. Um, and certainly uh, couldn't crowd that many into that length of border. I happened to be, in the summer of 66, I was serving on the, on the line that, below the Golan Heights. We had one company of paratroops holding the entire line from the Kinera to Matur. <laughs> With a few auxiliary units, but that was it. No, if anyone had tried to move one brigade into that area, we would have had a traffic jam, which we indeed, indeed have. When no. we did go up into the Golan Heights in 1967, we did it with a force that was about one quarter of what the Soviets alleged that Israel was massing at the time. Okay? And still, we had to get off the buses a few kilometers and walk the rest because the road was completely bumped up. So, to get back to your question, going to war is a very, always a risky business. It's even more risky when you have good but imperfect intelligence when you don't have enough people who understand the way the other side thinks, and when you haven't exhausted all the other possibilities. That's about the best I can say about lessons, but I want to add in general. We have a problem about drawing political conclusions from our book to the present day for the very simple reason that we don't have the same political opinions. And yet we, we can agree entirely on one finding from which is important, I think, for the entire Israeli or pro-Israeli political spectrum, and that is that our book does demonstrate, I think, quite conclusively, that Israel didn't initiate the war for expansionist purposes. On the radio this morning, someone called to put that exact accusation again. And Mazi Kumsey, by the way, so well known to all of us. I can imagine, but he's a regular Lutnik, but... <laughs> people, people, who call, people who call into radio programs as a better in the radio or broadcast, I can tell you, usually fall into that category. But, um, but the, the charge is made. And uh, it's made frequently, and it's made to this day. And unfortunately, some Israeli spokesmen who this gentleman quoted have uh, contributed to it. Uh, the, uh, the results of the war were that Israel did expand its territory, but if you go over the documents of the time and said that there's no question that Israel didn't initiate the war, and now we found out who did. So, uh, in that respect at least, I think this is a very important for the entire Israeli political spectrum. Now, from this you can extrapolate according to your political leanings. So you can say, as the right wing would, that, okay, so now under international law, since we weren't the aggressors here, we're under no obligation to return the territory. There's a price to be paid for losing an aggressive war, but not for winning a defensive war. 
um, the left wing can say, okay, it now shows that we're not obliged to give up any of these gains. And if we're doing it, we're doing it only out of our own enlightened self-interest. And that's a matter of your political opinion. It doesn't stem necessarily, logically, from the findings of our book. But I think the basic, that basic finding that Israel here was drawn intentionally into a war, I think is extremely important even for President Day. Without trying to extrapolate through the present day, it seems to me that the Soviets had a second opportunity in 1973, not so long after the Six-Day War. We're saving that option for our next, for, for the Soviet <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, this is what I wanted to ask about, because I, I was a very young man in Israel in 1973, not aware of all the Cold War mechanisms which were basically going on behind the scenes. So this was really a, uh, a, a clash of client states. Um, and the Russians apparently were in fact Barrett Coopers at the ready on planes about to actually go. So what surprises me to hear the story about the Six Day War is that in making these mistakes because of a crime, you know, a Soviet mentality and things, and things and so forth, you would have thought they would have had a chance to get it right. So well, how is it that how is it that, that 19, is it because the United States is much more involved in stuff? First of all, they got a lot brighter. It took them a while to get in, but eventually they did start it took, to the, 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 the Russians, the Soviets, got a lot better in '73 than in '67. Right. The cross canal offensive was the Soviet contribution. Um, if we can take this uh, advantage of this opportunity to advertise another recent publication of ours, uh, we. Uh, um, a paper of ours has appeared now as a chapter in a book on the superpowers in the Middle East, 67 to 73. And we seek to prove there that the so-called expulsion of Soviet advisors in 1972 by Sadat is a misnomer because it wasn't an expulsion. It was agreed not only with the Soviets but also with the United States. And B, uh, because the, the personnel that left Egypt were an advisor. They were the integral Soviet unions that had been sent down there before. The advisors remained and continued preparing the Egyptians uh, for the cross canal offensive. Um, but this did help in lull is it lulling Israel into the complacency that permitted that surprise. So, in uh, inculcating this concept that it was an expulsion, the Egyptians were throwing out the Soviets, they were moving over to the Western camp, etc., etc., uh, we found one major culprit to be Henry Kissinger, and the same Kissinger during the 1973 war, I think, but we still haven't done all the research on this, so this is it. Also, somewhat inflated at least the Soviet nuclear threat. Uh, but um, it's not entirely clear that they were about to fire nuclear or dip Scud missiles. Uh, not entirely clear at all. Um, but. Um, Yes, they were pulled, the Soviets, after the debacle in 1967, were sucked, in. were sucked in even deeper. It was a real tar baby they, because they, to redeem their prestige and their standing with the Arab lights. So they did send in, this time, there were up to 20,000 Soviet personnel at a time right. in Egypt and 50,000 all told. But which was the biggest intervention ever in the Cold War outside the, the, uh, until Afghanistan. Now, was, was, was Dumona again at the center of so little job? That's, that, that's the postscript of the book. Uh, and this is again some, somewhat speculative. Um, the fact that Israel did not try to demonstrate a nuclear weapon in 67. And as Shimon Peres has written quite transparently, he suggested it, and he was turned down. And the fact that in 73, when the situation was even more desperate, Israel didn't do so either. I think, at least, and here I'm not sure we agree entirely, um, has reduced, or at the time reduced, the effectiveness of Israel's nuclear deterrent because even in very dire straits, the political will was not demonstrated to use it. And this, I think, slightly decreased the Soviet and Arab concern about Israel's nuclear arms. I think maybe with Iran, Israel's nuclear deterrent has at last found something to work against. 
but uh, up to then, the immediacy of the concern was reduced, by, I think, both for the Soviets and for the Arabs, by the simple fact that it wasn't included. Well, I would like to <coughs> make a comment that someone also served in that area. Um, Dimona is known to be a very interesting site for the superpowers, and there were U2s that were visiting the area and MiG-25. And uh, we know today that the, I mean, the MiG-25 was built originally to intercept the U2s. No, it was built to intercept the B-70 that was never built. We we won't agree on this, but let's uh, for the for the argument that I want to take here. So we know today that definitely the MiG-25, uh, this is what they teach in the Israeli Air Force, uh, is a very limited uh, airplane in many abilities. It cannot be a bomber, and the uh, models that they did generate were a catastrophe, and this is why even the, the Russian Air Force is not uh, heavily leaning on that. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, a good friend of mine shot a MiG-25 in Lebanon. In an F-15 in, 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 in 1981. Actually, he was uh, in a Hawk missile okay. battery. Okay. It was a combined operation. Exactly. So, and, and we know today that the MiG-25 was far from like a big threat. And given the fact that uh, the Israeli-Arab conflict was a big lab for, you know, uh, checking uh, Western uh, Western weapons against uh, Russian weapon systems. And Soviet weapon systems too. So they said Russian systems, yeah. yeah. Um, maybe suggest that the, the fact that the Russians didn't take any active role in any of the of their wars, meaning they did have the advisors and they had the weapon systems given, but they didn't, uh, you know, heavily send uh, brig brigades. Yes, they did. They did in the 70s. In the war division, 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 there was a division and squad uh, and fighter squad. Yeah, division. but there were, there were also forces coming from Morocco and uh, forces coming from Iraq during the, the war. No, you're speaking about the war. Of, uh, we know that during the war of attrition, so the beginning in the uh, late 67, mm -hmm. the Soviet Union started to send regular uh, units. At the end, uh, by uh, 69, they, uh, they sent pilots with the MiG 21s, a special kind of uh, two, uh, two detachments, two units of uh, mm -hmm. pilots. And the beginning of the uh, end of 69 and the beginning of the 70, um, uh, they sent a full division of uh, anti aircraft and uh, sent uh, two and three mixed uh, uh, divisions which at any given point uh, was uh, numbered to over 10,000 uh, personnel. Regular units, which were sent not as a response to, uh, to the accusation that Israel started a deep bombing in January. It was decided and prepared for, uh, for sending it to Egypt. The earliest um, evidence that we found uh, well, is uh, given the August 1st, 69. Uh, combining, uh, assembling the force. And uh, the, uh, we have evidence, it's a sequel, it's work, yeah. uh, works, uh, work in uh, work uh, progress, progress <laughs> and so on, but we have evidence that uh, before Yom Kippur War in August, another of uh, regular units with send missiles were sent to Egypt specifically to take part in the hostilities. We know that there have been um, it's not uh, commandos uh, spe specifically brought on the first or second day of the war and uh, parachuted uh, behind the enemy lines, meaning into Israeli held territory, with the task of capturing Israeli centurion tanks because they wouldn't be hurt in such in numbers as we were expected, so they had to be checked because uh, there had the. Uh, 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 the armor, the armor had, had, had been uh, improved in Israel and so on. <coughs> we have uh, more, we don't have a book yet, but uh, if you will have uh, patience, 
I just like to respond to your no, if absolutely. You, if I just want to yeah. finish, you know, and then you can. Uh, what what I just want to and um, I I I know about several of those things that you mentioned, not about all, all of them, but uh, I also think that maybe you miss a point that maybe the Russians also uh, came into a point that they gambled. Okay, I mean they they might have more to lose than to gain. And this is why... Yeah, but what, what, I'm, what I'm asking is, is maybe the fact that they were leaning more on, a, you know, uh, maybe uh, one or two flights above Dimona will, uh, you know, uh, make the Israelis, uh, you know, sit and uh, not act. No, the contrary. On the contrary. To First of all, Israel, if, if you remember, mm -hmm. in '67, one of the questions debated uh, quite widely for how long Israel can allow itself to be mobilized with the econ economy as a standstill and, uh, and no fuel coming, no fuel coming sure. into the land. And then it's going to be. And, uh, and uh, uh, the second flight simply sh shown to Israelis that uh, they have time because uh, they were afraid that this is the beginning of the war. And, to, and even to put it more, the Israeli army was at the uh, threshold of replacing the old um, uh, arms, European arms with the, uh, with the American, new, new American arms that had been negotiated before. So you can imagine that Israel was at the lowest point of, uh, um, of protecting itself. So so now let me uh, let me just set the record straight. You said that the Israeli Air Force knew about the MiG, MiG-25. Not yet. No, 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 no. I said I said that we know now that the MiG-25 was not such a great airplane. Yes. But well, it's now not that. First of all, they have been uh, their uh, MiG-25 bomber was uh, developed with their uh, a nuclear option in hand. Much later. No, the nuclear bomb was accepted to the pro mass production in '69. The reconnaissance MiG-25 was accepted only in '72 after it finished its state uh, test trials in Egypt uh, um, uh, during the war attrition. There was there was a good reason, and I don't want, we can talk about it later. Why actually the Russians decided to develop the MiG-27? And the 23 and uh, not to keep the MiG 25 flying. But 23 went really into yeah. the test of flights in Egypt in the fourth But if, uh, I, uh, Yom Kippur if I may, I mean, instead of get, getting too far into the technicalities, what you're saying is absolutely correct in retrospect. But when, in 1967, suddenly an unknown aircraft appears with what looked then like awesome performance. I mean, it was by at least half a Mach number above anything that the Western Israel could field against it. Uh, and could fly much higher than anything than, com than combat aircraft. I'm not talking about the youth. And um, if they had sent it over Israel at a time of calm, that would be something else. But sending it over in a way that the Israelis were sure to detect because they were at top alert. And at the moment when Israel, when it was really touch and go toward war, then that to us is pretty un unambiguous. Uh, now, the Israelis at the time, as you say, later on, they, Israel did develop a method of shooting down. Israel shot down three MiG-20, Syrian piloted MiG-25s of Lebanon in the 1980s. But that was when? There was already the MiG the F-15, which was developed specifically against the MiG-25. Looks pretty much like a MiG-25. <coughs> and um, in combination with the improved Hawk missiles, um, neither of which existed in '67, and, and it was simply it came as a complete surprise. <coughs> we think there's already cer at least circumstantial evidence that this had even the Americans enough on edge to send the Liberty in. With Russians, with mainly Russian-speaking experts. There is also some uh, documentary evidence that by uh, May 27th, uh, reports that Israeli leadership uh, came to the conclusion that the war is inevitable. 
So you, you mean to say, I, I, I'm a bit puzzled here, you mean to say that the Russians actually induced the war while yes. they didn't yeah, want to? Yes, that's what we to say, yes. Read the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also, let, me also, so let me also recommend another book, if you, if you, if you haven't read it yet, uh, Ami Gluska's book. Ami Gluska, who was uh, President Herzog's aide de camp, and is a very fine historian, uh, has published a book, since he's a military man, he was given access to the still classified uh, minutes of the cabinet meetings and the general staff meetings in 67. And although a lot of it was censored, even so, there are dozens, literally dozens of instances where these two twin concerns of A, an attack on Limona, B, a direct Soviet military involvement came to the fore in Israeli concerns. And it may be that the Israelis were aware of more than we know for sure because we mentioned in passing to a former Israeli uh, intelligence officer who was in charge of the Soviet aspect, but later on, um, what do you think? Could those have been MiG-25? They said, of course, only 25. If there were only 21s, we would have shut them down. But it's never been officially If I understood you correctly, uh, you're, not, you're saying it wasn't so much the Israeli development of a nuclear potential as the Israeli signaling to, the, to, uh, to Moscow that they intended to develop uh, nuclear weapons that set things in motion. Uh, what do you think was the intention behind that? Was this a RL acting on its own? The Soviet document that, uh, cites this uh, disclosure treated this disclosure as an official uh, uh, statement made by Ishkol uh, uh, himself or, uh, or the government itself and uh, uh, trying to uh, to bring this issue to the uh, attention of the Soviet leaders, the nuclear issue. If this was an attempt to deterrence, it was very badly mistaken, because you can't deter someone with a weapon you don't yet have. On the contrary, you're, ask, you're asking him practically, well, prevent me from developing it. So someone has proposed to us the idea that Israel was then trying to achieve from the Soviets a commitment to stop conventional arms flows to the Middle East as a condition for accepting nuclear disarmament. And maybe this was the idea. We have a whole chapter here devoted to this with a whole range of possible motivations for Harel's event. Harel has confirmed in, his, in a book of his own that he did meet Sneh at this particular time. It doesn't say what to Unfortunately, he died a few months before the Soviet document was exposed, so we couldn't ask him. But uh, we have, there's a whole range of possible motives, ranging from the personal pique against Shimon Peres, which he had, <coughs> to such a degree that some of his subordinates have said that by this time he was not completely balanced. Not to use worse words than that. Uh, and and there's even something which, if true, would be a much more sensational book than this. Um, so several Soviet intelligence sources claim that at this period and later on, they had a very high-ranking source of whom the, they don't name, and of whom the description fits Harel to a T. But it also fits a number of other Israeli personnel. <laughs> so uh, even. The, the mind-boggling thing that even without his own knowledge, uh, without his connivance, certainly with his connivance, uh, Harel was serving as a source for the Soviets is mind-boggling. But we can't even propose it uh, without any further evidence than that. It does appear that it was done as a policy move, but a terribly misguided one, which is quite amazing for a person of Harel's stature. But there it is. The interesting thing in here is that Harel's version was published in 1987. This is the year after the Vanunu case. And uh, Harel doesn't say, of course, that he made a disclosure of similar import to Vanunu's 20 years earlier. Um, but my guess is, Isabel does not share this. Didn't go into the book. Oh, it did go into the book. Sorry, it did go into the book. In the footnote names me as the son. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, uh, that after the Vanunu case, Harel was forestalling some future revelation of the content of his talk with Snip. 
and say, well, this was an intentional policy move. It was not my giving away a state secret. Uh, because Vanunu was judge for treason and served 18 years. So uh, it's, uh, this is a very intriguing question, is what the motive was. But we, since Harald confirmed it, and since we have no reason to doubt the content of the Soviet document, the fact is that the, the effect was what it was, no matter what the motive was. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, from what I've read of the, the book, it seems really interesting, and I'm I think astonished, as you are, just how shoddy and incomplete the intelligence is on, on all sides, but especially the, the Soviets. Um, you know about about Israel's capabilities, not just nuclear capabilities, but its conventional military capabilities. But to pick up on what you were you were just saying is, I just can't understand how the Soviets would put so much stock into this report that they get from SNET and, and a few other pieces of scattered evidence. But this especially this this one conversation, I mean, it just seems like criminally insane to put so much stock into that that they would take what? this enormous. What? What? You have the well, advisor. You have Mr. Security in Israel. But they're getting it second Passing, hand. But it's not, third hand. It, it, what do you mean second hand, third hand? Well, they're getting it through SNE. I mean, SNE was, uh, they, in 65, yeah, the Israeli Communist Party hadn't split. SNE was still the leader of the Communist Party. And um, he was a trusted. trusted source for the Soviets. The, 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 the book that they published, the Soviet Foreign Ministry documents, it's full of reports presented by SNE on various Israeli political that they relied on. And um, they had no reason not to rely on it. He gave them perfectly truthful information. Now, uh, and Harel devotes an entire chapter in that book of his, in which he, every chapter is how I exposed this Soviet spy and how I exposed that Soviet spy and so on. And then there's a chapter proving that Harel was not a Soviet spy, that SNE was not a Soviet spy. Uh, which again uh, seems very extraordinary. Why he would, 1987, he would care to devote an entire chapter uh, to proving that this person was not a Soviet spy, but he admits, him, but a, a communist leader who's asked by uh, the Soviet Union to provide some information can't say no. So in other words, he was a source, he was an informant for the Soviets, but he was not an active agent for the Soviets. This is what Carmel is trying to say, which seems very extraordinary that he should care if you to mean, uh, If you mean by primary source, a document source, uh, different uh, um, information, let me tell you that the Soviet Union kept a very, very attentive eye on this really nuclear project. And uh, uh, even in later years, they were uh, very much surprised to, uh, to read in the newspaper that one of the Syrians uh, who crossed into Israel uh, in the 80s, I think, right? He, uh, he had a, a photograph taken inside of Dimona, and uh, that according to him on the, the interrogation, he stated that uh, the photographs were provided by the Soviet uh, uh, intelligence. So uh, in this case, don't take one document as a sole uh, evidence or the sole base on which the Soviets will have to take case. They, uh, apparently, they had a lot of sources. They had analysts who, uh, uh, you know, who produced uh, their uh, final uh, um, opinion about uh, this thing. But they would trust SNE explicitly to, uh, to uh, transmit the verbal message from the high Israeli authority as an official message, the, uh, the document itself says it. This is at a period when Israel was in considerable hesitation. The decision after Ben Gurion left power in 63, uh, whether to continue the nuclear project as he had set it up, or to change course with me. And there was considerable division in the Israeli leadership on this issue at the time. This has been exposed in other books, by the way. Um, now, Harel is on record as being against. He was against it for a number of reasons. He uh, told the dependence of France, he was mistaken. 
And he had some other reasons to oppose it. And there was also a turf war between him and Paris over the security apparatus that protected the people. It was taken out of Harel's hands when he was still with the security service. So he, one motive you could ascribe to this uh, move was to try and shoot down the nuclear project by inviting Soviet pressure. That's a possibility too. But all these are pure speculation. The, the end result was that a Soviet foreign ministry internal document states, you know, we now have the, uh, uh, we now have official information, solid information, that the Israelis, despite their public protestations, are going ahead with development of nuclear weapons. And the Soviets were very much concerned about this. If you remember, in 1962, for the West, it was a big victory. The Soviets pulled their missiles out of Cuba. But the Soviets also did get a quid pro quo. The US pulled its missiles out of Turkey. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, for the Soviets, was a big concern. And for them, it was uh, some consolation prize for the fiasco of Cuba. And now, four years later, this gap in the Western nuclear encirclement, I'm using Soviet, the Soviet description now, this gap, the missing link between NATO and CENTO, is being plugged by Israel. And um, they were, I think, quite genuinely concerned with a Western nuclear capability within range of the Soviet Union. And this, by the way, is one place where the analogy with the U.S. and Iran today doesn't hold, because Iran is much farther away from the U.S. than Israel is from the Soviet Union. Can I, can I just, I mean, yeah. what, what exactly did they think, so it's think, was the status of the, the nuclear program well, at the moment of the U.S. war? Well, um, we mentioned here, although we don't, we, as I said, we don't enter into the actual history, but there were what, what was published did concern them. And we figured that their, their, their intelligence in Israel was pretty good at this. Their, their field intelligence was quite good. What they, where they went wrong, like Israel went wrong in 73, was an interpretation. And in perhaps the, the top level of intelligence, suiting their reports, just like the CIA did now, suiting their reports and interpretation to what the political bosses wanted to hear. But uh, the field intelligence was not bad at all. Now, there, if we have a report, I think came out in Al Khayat first, in February 67, that Israel had completed a test of not a nuclear explosion, but a test of a nuclear, what's known as a zero yield test. Uh, this came, and it, this has been confirmed, by the way, by the leader of the Israeli thing in very transparent language, and this actually happened in the previous November. Okay, if the Soviets got wind of this, at least when it was published, and probably earlier, then uh, they were concerned that Israel was on the brink. And the same Israeli um, director of the nuclear of the weapons program actually writes that on May 28th, Israel's most important weapon system that we have been working on for so long was finally assembled and made operational by our technicians working around the clock. And then we have Paris saying that on June 2nd, when my friend Bayan was appointed minister after he had been appointed minister of defense, I suggested to him that we do something that would have deterred the Arabs and prevented them. All this kind of fits together and it's we would think that the Soviets at least had something. Um, uh, this is a prayer because I got to ask a whole lot of questions. At the same, but there's one thing I didn't get to ask, which is um, it's more of a process question in terms of putting the evidence together and put together. One of the things I found fascinating was that, uh, um, you know, like in America, what you did is, is you had the Freedom of Information Act request to get some old documents, even if a lot of words were blocked out. But one of the things that's interesting to me is that in the Politburo of the Soviet Union, the most serious decisions, nothing was ever written down. Can you talk about that a little bit and how you go around making together such a case involving such serious political decisions when the, the best piece of evidence is it just doesn't exist or well, may not exist? The, lecture, the, the part of the lecture that is about the later varies from our standard presentation and that because of uh, the forum here, we took out the methodology and put in the anti-Semitism. <laughs> uh, so the methodology part, 
um, is that the biggest objection that's always made to us, but no Soviet documents have ever been found to support this. First of all, some have. Uh, some have emerged, as we pointed out, inadvertently with very easily disproved datings and so on and so forth. But for the, for the most part, they have. There, there's no Politburo decision saying, we are going to plan to pull Israel into a preemptive strike and then we'll support the Arabs and we'll do this and we'll do that. If we expect that to come out, then this chapter of history will never be written. Now, of course, the absence of documents doesn't prove anything. But the absence of documents, at least in the Soviet case, and as we show, also in the Israeli and American case, the absence of documents should not be allowed to uh, excise uh, entire uh, portions from the historical record. Because then it really makes it very easy, as all will write, you know, to shove things down the memory hole. Either you don't document them to begin with, or you document them in a way that's designed to conceal the facts rather than to record them. And we bring a, wonderful, a beautiful example for how Gromyko instructed people you don't write documents to reflect the, what we actually want. You write the documents because 30 years from now, historians will see them. And uh, so you could either not record the things at all, write them down in a misleading way, suppress them forever, or release them selectively. And in all these ways, you can prevent the historical record from being correctly well, written. Uh, I'm just to finish uh, the answer. What we decided to do was to assemble as many facts as possible as to what really took place in reality on the, on the ground, in the field. Mm -hmm. And then when you piece together the facts, they give you some kind of, uh, uh, of showing you the way. Because if you hear that this submarine left the uh, uh, Soviet base on this and this day and had such orders, and this ship left the shipyard on May 3rd and already was sent into the Mediterranean. And then that you, uh, uh, when you read that uh, the planes, uh, uh, the, the, the pilots of this uh, strategic force had to pass an exam uh, uh, for everything connected to the Hawk missiles, how they work, how to avoid them, and so on. So you add piece by piece to, uh, to the argument. And uh, what we did, really, what we say, that uh, we assembled the facts. And if you uh, differ with our opinion, it, uh, you can uh, we have your own opinion. There's another thing here. The fixation of most conventional historiography on archival evidence seems to imply that other types of evidence are less reliable. Mm -hmm. But much of the Western historiography of the Cold War in general, and the Cold War in the Middle East in particular, rests on other kinds of evidence. The whole uh, orthodoxy about what Soviet policy was rests, as one of our colleagues has put it, on reading tea leaves. <laughs> you know, Pravda articles, communiques of the Soviet government, and a bit later on, on memoirs. You, you, you start following the track of footnotes from one publication to the next, okay? and you find that for a slightly later period, even more than for this one, like for the War of Attrition, the War of 73, everything is built up with Muhammad Hassanin Haika. Everything. Last year, we went uh, to the conference in England. Uh, and one of the participants, uh, her field of research is Egypt. She said, you know how high school is cool? $5,000 uh, answer. You pay him $5,000 and, and, and he will answer you whatever you need. <laughs> so, so, uh, and it's not only high school. If you look at Kissinger's memoirs, same thing. And they also are practically a biblical standing in history. So when we have members of the Soviet military participants, especially the lower one, they said, I arrived in, the, in Egypt on this day, I left on this day, I did so and so and so. Yeah. You, you can trust the guy that he's no, like, no, No less. No less, less at least. Right. Right. So, we, so yes, we're relying on evidence that is, is very, you have to treat with a lot of care. But if you have, say, a dozen different sources, unrelated sources, one guy writes this thing in Donetsk, and another one writes it in Vladivostok, and they don't know each other. They 
didn't serve on the same ship, but we have testimonies from four, five, six different Soviet ships, the same, and they all say pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. So say that this guy was on a frigate and he was ordered to raise a 30-man landing party. And then there's a submarine tender um, where they raised 175 men because they had a larger crew. And there's a destroyer whose commander became later admiral of the fleet. And he writes in his memoirs that he was called to the flagship in the Mediterranean and told to take on a landing party of 175 cadets. 100 cadets. 100, sorry. And, uh, and so on and so forth. You know, this assembles into quite a mass of evidence that you can't disregard. And took on the plates. It's not very likely that we'll ever have the files of the Soviet High Command. If, 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 if as you say, they exist there, because, again, the whole passing orders early down the chain of command occurs throughout. The submarine commander was told early on such and such a single the five-year missile. The bomber commander was told early, paint the planes in Egyptian color, and so on and so forth. So, read the book. <laughs> <laughs> so then we're a bit over time, so on that yeah. note, uh, reading the book. Um, Lambeth Bookstore is here actually selling copies. You can get signed mm -hmm. copies from the we author. Can have lunch. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. I'm <laughs> sorry we didn't get to all the questions. If you wish, you can stay here for the informal conversation. <laughs>